Welcome to Real Money Talks. Real strategies from the money makers and the world changers that you can use to make millions, keep those millions, multiply your wealth, and build your team. Here's your host, author of five New York Times bestsellers, money expert on Dr. Phil, CNN, CNBC, The Street TV, Fox News, and The View, Laurel Langmeyer. I wanted to have some fun starting off today. Hope you guys had an amazing weekend. I had an amazing weekend. Um, and we really take this freedom seriously. So I thought I'd have all the accoutrements of it. And we're going to be broadcasting. We are live on all social channels. So those of you that are out on social channels, ask questions. I'm going to give just a good 20, 25 minutes of just straight content. So those of you that are out in the chat, uh, let us know where you are calling in from. And those of you on social channels, again, put any questions in the chat. And uh, when we talk about financial freedom and financial independence, it means something different to everyone. So, uh, you know, what, what I say when people say they want financial freedom or they just want freedom, uh, what usually comes through once that's all dissected is I want to live by choice. I want to do what I want, when I want, with a, who I want, right? You, want, you just want choices versus the needing to show up to a job you know, to work someone else's, you know, business dream. Now, some of you don't have big business dreams um, and your dream is to support a big team. So like that is a very worthy goal. Uh, but what does freedom mean in the context of all of that for you? And actually, I'd love for you to put in the chat, what does financial freedom mean to you? Um, you're in Omaha, Thomas. Wow. You're like, you could go like 40 miles out to where I grew up and go see the Langmire, you know, the Langmire Lamb Farm Family Ranch. I was, I was going to swing by and take uh, pictures for posterity's sake. <laughs> you, you know, you could take pictures of the 4-H lambs and pigs and, you know, where it all began, right? <laughs> it's funny. But it's actually so, funny, Laurel, because as we know, we're, we're editing now the Make Your Kids Millionaires book and talking about your story growing up on a farm from Nebraska. It's, uh, yeah, I could take some pictures for the book today. We'll get that done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So what does financial freedom mean to you? Go ahead and put that in the chat. And those of you out on social channels, what does that definition mean? Some of you, like you may not put the word financial is what I see. A lot of times you'll just put the word, right? You just want freedom. Well, what does that mean? So uh, we're also going to be cutting this as a podcast. So Thomas, I'm going to have you uh, just head off to me on camera. Those of you that are watching on the podcast, as well as Real Money Talks, download it on any of the app stores. We're up leveling it soon to be on iHeartRadio and uh, Pod Nation and a lot of other places. So excited as we expand our podcast uh, more broadly. And this is really serious. Like we're at the halfway point of 2021. So if you think back to our new year, new you conversation, we went through eight areas of your life. Now there's an app coming soon that I'm gonna introduce you to that actually goal sets in seven of those eight areas. See the eighth area that I, in, that I add in that a lot of people don't add in and I think it's just critical is your uh, physical environment. But when you did your goal setting in 2021, right? How are you doing? I mean, we're at the halfway mark, just a little over the halfway mark. Are you on track to make the money that you said you wanted in 2021, right? If you said you wanted 120,000, you or 10,000 a month, you better be, I mean, by now, if you want a 10,000 a month, you better be closer to the seven, 8,000 mark um, as, you're, as you're doing it, or at least at the halfway mark at 5,000, right? So where are you? So that's kind of the first question. Um, so I wanna go back through some of these. So what does it mean to do what you want to when you want? Financial freedom uh, means the ability to earn money independently of my time and geography, to travel where and when I want, be able to help others, uh, Cheryl says financial freedom is the uh, is a chance to choose with no limits of time what I can buy and do and give. That's great. I love that. Uh, Jason Henderson says money freedom, time freedom, service freedom. So as you define freedom, we're going to go through and talk about financial freedom, specifically how do you forecast for financial freedom? So I don't like the word budget, budgets like diets, it seems to be really restrictive, but forecasting is like a projection into the future of what you're going to do. And I've had this question quite frequently lately on Clubhouse and other uh, platforms that I've been on. So I thought I would explain the millionaire maker way to handle debt. More importantly, how do you forecast your spending 
because no one teaches you how to spend. There's a lot of people who say they teach you how to make money. I guarantee we're the best in class in the world because um, we can do it in a few short days. And I've stopped saying, by the way, team and our internal group, uh, and those of you that have been with clients, I've, I've stopped saying that we're gonna have a two-day workshop. I'm, gonna, I'm starting to say, all I want is 13 hours of your time and I'll change your life. So I want from 10 to six on Thursday and 10 to three on Friday, 13 hours, and I'll change your life with money because you'll have an opportunity to make some. So this week we're going into a, another one of our marketplace every three weeks, mark it on your calendar. We are very, very serious. Those of you that are graduates, you'll join at three and then obviously you'll continue to marketplace. So um, how to sign up, go ahead and put that in the chat. So Steve and Molly, put in the chat at this point, I would just call Molly and get signed up. Uh, St. George says that um, and you sign up through the marketplace. Right now we are doing uh, actually complimentary tickets but there is a $47 commitment fee because uh, if you don't show up, we're keeping your 47. When you show up, because it's your commitment, then you can have it back. But uh, we are doing a commitment fee because um, we staff for you. And last time we had a huge, huge room and a lot of no shows. We just can't do no shows. We're serious about it. And if you're serious about it, we're the right match. If you're just kind of casually poking around on the internet, we are not your people. Um, now, as you like poke and stay and say, yeah, I'm going to click here and I want to stay, then we are your people. But we're very serious about when we teach, especially, you know, when I'm using, you know, a day and a half, 13 hours of my time to be with you and teach you. It's serious stuff. So excited about teaching it how to make money. Um, one thing I want to go back to physical environment, and there's a question mark. So physical environment is so critical because it is the thing very few people set goals about, but it's something to strive for. Because your physical environment also, it's you know, it it supports or distracts from your state. Meaning, are you do you have a great energy for today, and you're going to like get it, you know, and sell and um, be excited when you wake up, or it's like, oh, I hate where I live. I don't like my you know house or apartment, uh, or you just don't even like the state you're living in. You live there because your family lives there. Do you like the vehicle you drive, the cars, you know, the or the the office you show up to? Your physical environment does produce a lot of mental energy to you that most people don't take, uh, that they take for granted. So that's what that all means. All right. And those of you, again, out of social channels, I uh, hope you have notes, take notes, take notes. So I pulled this off, uh, dusted it off. It is one of our, what we call our three core programs and our three processes. So your wealth cycle, this is called building your wealth cycles. I um, developed it in the early 2000s is how to build your wealth plan. So that's what I'm pulling from because if you don't have this, it comes with a six hour audio that is critical for you to build your wealth plan. Then I have another one, which is how to build your business plan. Your business plan is a subset of your wealth plan. So I want you to draw, like you draw a huge umbrella. Your wealth plan is everything about your life, right? It's, uh, it's inclusive of how you do money in your family. It's inclusive of your investments. It's inclusive of your retirement plans, your pension plans, whatever you have in that category. We self-direct all of our uh, you know, self-directed plans. It's inclusive of your now forecast. We're going to get rid of the word budget. It's inclusive of how you invest it, any of the you know, assets that you own, whether you own other businesses, own other real estate. Your wealth account is the big thing. It's everything that you own that's now held in trust. And uh, those of you that need life insurance, Jason, you are welcome. Uh, you're one of the few, but I will let you. Uh, uh, if you need life insurance, and then he can direct you to Scott, who does our trust, uh, you need all of this. You, the, your wealth plan for legacies goes through life insurance into a trust, and that's how it's held. So that's what, how serious this one. This one's the big one. This is the plan of your life. Your business plan is your business plan. If you have two or three businesses, you probably need two or three plans. And then expression of your power, we've talked about you know, endlessly, which is what Bob Proctor and I did with uh, your mindset. Those are our kind of core three stock educations. When you become a client, you got to go through it. So some of you have been a client and you still haven't gone through this. So let's dive in. What does forecasting mean? I've had this question several times, literally in the last seven to 10 days, um, specifically on Clubhouse. It's a platform I hang out on a lot now these days. It's like my new stage. And the question of, where you always talk about making money, investing money, well, but you don't talk about budgets. And I'm like, ah, I hate that word. Budgets are like diets. So we don't use that word. I change the words frequently to positive words. Like I don't use the word retirement very often. I use it more of an association because you know what that is. But by definition, it's an agricultural word that means for cattle to pasture to die. It has nothing to do with money. Although it has trained the world to say retirement's when you're old 
and somebody's going to give you money, right? It's just, it's just this bad word. So we call it financial freedom because I also don't want the AIDS association that you can't have financial freedom when you, until you retire. I think you can have financial freedom whenever, right? I have my millionaire. Um, so I had my millionaire uh, moment, right? 1999 when I, in June, when I turned 34 years old, right? So it was around that moment when I became a millionaire. So was I financially free then? No, because I still needed to build more cash flow into my asset base and build more passive income streams in my business side. So all that being said, let's talk about this word that you're no longer going to use called budgeting, and I call it forecasting. So what I want you to do, um, and just to kind of talk through what is in this book, right? So when you talk about forecasting, there's actually forms that I give you that you're going to fill out. Now you can get this digitally or you can get it in a workbook. And I would encourage you because your memory, the memory technique that goes on in your brain doesn't associate with typing on a keyboard. It actually associates to your writing. Believe it or not, there's an enormous correlation. So I prefer you get the workbook, get the audio and let me talk you through how to fill it out. But there are literally workbook pages of all of the income you're gonna make. So here's, here's let me just give you like some big ones and we'll dissect it. So what you do is you take the money you're going to make per month. So let's just say that you are on track or on average, you're making five a month, eight a month, 10 a month, 20 a month. How are you going to spend it? Now, you, some of you are still living two lives. You have a personal life and then uh, an entity or corporate life. So your personal life, we want to really atrophy the use of your personal life because the only thing you should be paying for out of your personal bank accounts should be things that you can't deduct, right? So I don't use a lot. Uh, my life's very integrated, hence integrated well systems. So I don't have a personal life and a professional life. I have a life and my kids are a huge part of that life. And as they get older, they're more and more part of that life. So in my personal bank account, I get paid a small, small salary and it's determined based on, write this down, this is very strategic and it's really important that you guys go back and re-listen to this because I'm gonna give a lot of gems. Some of you will get it and some of you need to re-listen several times. So for the money that you make, so let's just start with those of you that make a paycheck, that goes into your personal bank account. You can loan it or give it to the entity, but you don't have a paycheck ever go to the entity. That is a ridiculously, that just crosses your taxation of money. So W-2 income, payroll income, if you're watching from the world is when you work for someone else and you get a paycheck. That is the worst money because of the way that it's taxed, right? You make it, it's taxed before you even get it. So, when my company pays my paycheck, it puts it into my personal bank account from the company, just like your who employs you. But the amount is only that that I can't deduct inside my corporate life and my corporate structure from my accountant, right? My, my tax strategist. So a lot of you, if you're high income earners, because you get paid a lot, that's where your corporate, uh, your corporation needs to take over paying more and more bills. So you have more deductions. See, as an individual, you can't do deductions. As a company, you get to do deductions. That's worldwide. All right, so you have a personal bank account. The only thing that should be in there is like the basics, you know, everything but your home office, you know, um, you can write off part of your utilities, you write off part of your car, your technology, your, your phone. I know people that walk around, I have two I walk around with. Some people I know have four that they walk around with, um, you know, critical critical, critical for you to, uh, one sec. critical for you to know the difference. Let's talk about the corporation though. And inside the Wealth Cycle book, um, there is a whole corporate structure on what you can deduct and what you should be spending. So that is on page 64 and 65. And I give you complete structures and lists of things that you can do for just basic deductions. But here's the deal when you forecast. So I want you to forecast, here's the idea of it, between your personal, right, what comes in personally, where are you spending it? And when it comes in corporately, which is more important, where are you spending it? So you're not gonna say a savings account, because savings is an undefined lump of money. You're gonna say, I want a wealth account. So a wealth account to a lot of us in our community is a flip Wall Street account. It's a place you're gonna put money that from there you can go invest in other assets. You'll have a charity account. You might have a college or a business account for kids as they get older, right? At 10 years old, I start a car account. So whatever allocation I have for that or whatever allocation I have for Roth IRAs. Um, 
So how are you going to spend it? And here's the big activity I want you all to do. And it's more challenging than it's going to sound. I want you to intentionally forecast spending every penny. So not like go out and spend it physically on paper, which I give you all the forms in here, which is why I want you to go get this. Those of you who are already a client, you have it. If you're not a client, you need to go get it. Um, so Steve, if you want to put in the chat how they get the workbook and the audios, we'd like to ship it out to you. I think we're going to give you a $47. Uh, normally, this is 199 bucks. So for those of you who are not clients, it's 47 bucks plus shipping and handling, and we will get it out to you. Um, and so I want you to spend every penny. So you say, all right, well, how do I do that? We'll start with the fixed costs, right? So what are your fixed costs per month? Your mortgage, maybe you have a car payment or you have a lease, um, your phone payment, <coughs> internet payment, utility payment, uh, any of just the, the core stock things that you fixed, you know, expenses that you have. Some of you may have some variable uh, different expenses that you pay for on a monthly basis. And then start allocating and divide by 12, like annualize your payment. So if you pay like a big insurance payment because it's cheaper to do it once a year, then either allocate more out that month or allocate it throughout the year that it's taken into your insurance account. Or other um, big annual payments would be like membership fees or like your corporate, um, your, your, your corporate reinstatement fees, right? That you have to pay the Secretary of State or you pay Scott, a controller to reinstate and uh, make sure that your corporations never fall into default. So you do have some annual, you have some monthly, and you have, um, well, typically it's monthly, it's monthly or annual. So you wanna proportionalize that into a spending plan. So you can do it on paper. I don't, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. Uh, when you do get this, it actually gives you a lot of forms and documents that you can just fill them in. But I want to literally want you, depending on how much you average on, on average. So here's what you entrepreneurs who have a little bit of varying cash flow take the average of the last 90 days, right? Or four months, 120 days. How much on average did you make? And then going forward, how would you responsibly spend it, right? Knowing that you want financial freedom at the end of this, which means a large chunk, as much as you can take. A lot of people say 10% pay yourself first. I'd say take 20 or 30. If you can take as much as you can to pay yourself to go buy new assets, right? That would be your wealth account, right? And then if you want an emergency account, call it an emergency account. Now, I think three months for you higher income earners, if you know how to make money, parking three months into just sitting in cash, doing nothing Susan Orman style is ridiculous. At least put it into a flip account so it's making some interest and you have some money uh, that's actually invested. So I totally disagree. And so I'm gonna, that's why they should be stirring lots of questions out there on these social channels. Uh, that is, is not what we're doing. So you take the average of your last 90 days of income and say, all right, I'm gonna spend it all on paper, right? So again, right, mortgage, maybe you have an office rent, maybe you have you know, a variety of car payments, like I have my car account for Tristan right now. Um, I have college slash business, business accounts that go for her. I have, you know, like Logan's a business partner of one of my real estate companies. So he's in a completely different class of spending right now. Doesn't even, you know, hit my personal radar ever. Um, Cause he completely lives college scholarship life where he lives corporate life. So everything that you are fixed and then any variable, but the number, and I want you to flag it and put like, you know, stars all over it. <laughs> I want you really to get that number up per month of what you make, what do you invest? And where do you put it? And this is gonna force you to start looking at money rules also in this book. This book is rich, rich, rich. It should be out at all times. Now, if you have debt, right? Let's go here. So page 56 and 57, when you get the workbook, this breaks down all your credit cards and you're gonna allocate the millionaire way of paying off debt. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna allocate a certain amount towards bad debt, because you gotta pay your base minimums. And then one card, you pay more but you don't pay a balance of all of them. That is a really bad way to get out of debt. You're gonna end up paying more interest. The way that I describe in the book exactly gets you out of debt. So between The Millionaire Maker, page 194, and The Wealth Cycle book, we'll teach you how to get out of debt, Millionaire Maker style. So let's just say you owe $700 a month in credit card payments, then there's a credit card line, and then you say 700, and then what are you paying per card, right? Maybe you have student loans, so don't just say debt define it i when i say forecast i want it down to the nitty gritty of what are you spending and i can tell you 
when my coach way back in the day gave me this activity, it's rougher than you think. So if you are in coaching, a lot of you that are here, at least on the live broadcast are in the big table. So use your coach to go through this. And if your coach is kind of rusty on it, let me know. And we'll, you know, actually <laughs> we should send this all out because not a lot of our clients come in massive, you know, issues of debt. Um, and even those of you that have healthy debt, you know, I primarily use between my companies four or five different cards on a regular basis, but they're associated to different companies. So each card would have a full payoff schedule every month. Um, like I use one card specifically for all the tech, which is 15 to $20,000 a month <laughs> for all the tech and all the emailing and all the texting and everything we do. So that goes on one card. So there is, how do you spend everything? If you have your kids on a never pay your kids an allowance plan, is that 50 a month or 100 a month? Like I'm talking detail, detail, detail. Every line item has to have a category. I can promise you your bookkeeper, if they don't know how to do any of this, they should be fired and you need to get some new ones who know how to really structure this. This forecasting will change your life. And you don't have to do it all the time because you do it once, you go through it with your bookkeeper, they code it that way, you should be fairly set. So as you go through it, let me do proper allocations. And then if you just have a stuff category, right, don't put it in savings, just say, you know, like it'd be interesting to see, go back through your credit cards or through your apps and see how much you spend at your coffee shops. See how much you spend at DoorDash and Grubhub and all those places, see how much you really spend in each of these categories and be real about those numbers. And if you are a shopper, like my husband is, um, who likes to just, you know, swing through different clothing stores just to buy stuff, then have a clothing allowance or a stuff allowance, right? Because you just like to shop. The deal is like, I don't care. Like we're not, I'm not the, the, those kind of people. I am the kind of people who are like, if you want it, go make the money to have it and go spend it, right? Buy what you want. I am not the other side of this conversation, which is don't, you know, live within your means and conserve and be frugal. No, have whatever you want, but you better make the money to have it. And then be very clear about your spending. And the most important thing, is ratchet up that number. Don't just do 10% to pay yourself. I mean, what I love about the clients that are really serious, and I can name a few of them, they are on the, you know, they're between 15 and 20,000 of new money now, um, but they're used to a four or $5,000 lifestyle. To me, that means at least 10 of that, like some of that will be used to spend to build their business, like buy better databases, buy, you know, pay people to do more funnels or Facebook ads or whatever they're doing to like market, like business growth. But a lot of that, like if you can live a four or $5,000 a month and then take a few extra thousand to grow your company and take the rest and invest it, you've got financial freedom in your horizon. That's what it takes to be a three to five year millionaire. So I know we don't talk about the spending side, but I really wanted to you know, share that spending side. And Thomas, if you wanna come back live, let's say, uh, answer some questions. Like this is a thorough read. This goes through a lot of stuff. I mean, from getting incorporated, if you're not incorporated, you can't do these deductions. And then your spending's off from the beginning. So it's get incorporated, get your life insurance. Jason, I don't know if you put that in, I wasn't paying attention when I was teaching in the chat. You are welcome to put uh, the insurity uh, solutions uh, and our insurity systems number in there, Jason, to get you know anybody who doesn't have insurance and a trust. So those are all structural. Then how do you make it? And this is really, I hope this served you on how you spend it. So Thomas, what's the chat say? Let's go chat to social media. What questions do have people have about this and was it helpful? Absolutely. So just as Laurel said, this is an interactive live session. Go ahead in the chat box below. Let us know what your question is when it comes to forecasting. Uh, obviously, we're here darn near halfway through the year. And at this point, you should be projecting towards where you're going to be uh, financially on uh, a monthly average by the end of the year. Uh, and so you need to understand, you know, what you can be looking at and start planning for appropriately. Um, so team, if you have those questions on social media, go ahead and put those into the chat box at the same time. Uh, Laurel, uh, as we're waiting for some more questions to come in here, one of the first things I'd ask you is, say if someone's not hitting their goal uh, when it comes to the monthly number, what would be the first place you'd have them to look specifically uh, a marketing or sales? Sales. Mm -hmm. Sales. I mean, well, I, I say it two ways. Sales is always my number one answer is make more money. Mm -hmm. um, but then you got to back up a little bit and say, if you don't have any leads to call, then you need to get out and market. 
So your day could look like, which every revenue producing day should look like, like there's not a day where we're not marketing and selling like seven days a week. I mean, maybe a few holidays, we don't do the sales calls, but I'd say out of 357, what do you think, Thomas? I think we do 347, 345. Like, I don't know that there's many days that we are not as a team, somebody in a sales process for this organization and this group. <clears throat> and <clears throat> excuse me, and I'm going to go wider because Jason and I are partners, right? Scott and I are partners. So whether we're selling or like Stacey Maynard, I know she's telling to sell, my, sell wine for us all the time. So there is always sales going on. So if you need money, you got to sell it. But you got to have the leads to sell too. So you should be out in social channels, always getting new leads, bringing new leads into your database, and then calling through and selling them, doing a sell ask. So it should always be a combination during the day. Do you have a rule of thumb that you use with your students when it comes to their what their average close rate should be? Yes. Well, first I want to go back up and say, for you to be successful, our numbers for you to have a revenue producing day is 21 new leads. That means names, phone numbers, and emails. So 21 new people, not just DMing on Instagram and all of that. Like we don't even count those really. I mean, Thomas and Steve, I mean, Andrew, they're the ones that do all that. But I don't believe we count all those people because they, they're, you don't sell from a DM or, you know, uh, a, a shared post. Typically, you got to get a name, phone number, and email, and you get them on a phone call to do an ask to last. So 21 names a day. And if you can sell two of them, that's about a 10% close ratio. That's like a minimum base that we go for. Then as you get more sophisticated, where you're really going to make the money is you increase your closing ratio. So now out of the 21, go get four sales. You do that, you're on your way to six, well into six figures. If you can get, if you can do that consistently, that's the challenge. That's actually maybe instead of rack up your revenue, that didn't really take off. People didn't get that campaign. I think we should say, you know, are you doing your 21 and four? Like that for sure. I could almost put a guarantee if you got 21 leads a day and can sell four of them a day, like in, in your sleep, you should be making six figures. I mean, you literally would have to be sleeping to not make six figures if you could go find 21 people that will follow you and you have their name, phone number, and email, and they'll respond to you and you get four of them to buy, you're home free. That is financial freedom. Got it. So 10% at a minimum as you get better, 20% or more yeah. on that sales conversion percentage. As we're waiting for questions to come into the lab, go ahead, put them in the chat box below. Steve and the team did put in that $47 link. For those of you who have not yet utilized that resource, don't, uh, go do that now. Go to integratedwealthsystems.com slash wealth47. You can click on the link below, be able to uh, download, purchase that resource and start putting together uh, your forecasting for the rest of the year. And again, use on a regular basis to help your business. So we have a question from Jason. He says, what's the difference between a spending plan and forecasting? Um, you can call them the same. Uh, it, you can call them the same. You've heard me use that back and forth. I use forecast. The reason I, I use that word more is because I use it more in here in forecasting to your financial freedom. Uh, but a lot of people, that word didn't catch on. Like a lot of sometimes, you know, I'll make up new words and set a budget. Uh, and forecasts kind of didn't catch on as much. So I did start using spending plan, but they're synonymous. Spending plan and forecast in our world is synonymous. Um, but yeah, the forecasting didn't take up on as much as the spending plan. That just kind of makes sense as I'm going to spend my money. Um, also, just for the uh, kind of the recording as well, another great definition Nancy said is, uh, to me, financial freedom means sufficient financial resources to, to enable me to grow my investments and travel, live, and enjoy life as I desire. Um, and then there's the link for that workbook. Um, we're giving it to you for 47 bucks. Again, the whole series is 199 typically. So there's a link in the chat. Um, do you want to make sure everybody has it in other social chats? Uh, if you want to, I'll just say it out loud. It's integratedwealthsystems.com, integratedwealthsystems.com forward slash wealth 47. So that will get you that link. If you just go to my store, off integrated wealth is going to be 199 bucks. So you won't get that deal. Correct. Uh, John, what do you mean by MSU? Um, do you MSU, mean make stuff up? Well, we always do that. Um, but is there a question inside of that? So I want to make sure you have that. Are, are there any social questions for this? It's really, really important that you, as, as much as we focus you on income and funnels and how that works and how you have that sequence to the client, how you make that money 
uh, and how you spend it will define it will define how fast you become a millionaire because most of you you make it spend it make it spend it make it spend it you're not investing enough money and that's the millionaire pattern is you got to make it invested like you're the priority your family's the priority of making and spending of investing the money right and you say well i'm spending for my family too well yeah but you got to put that that spending in order right i was also asked a really interesting question on how do you hire mentors on clubhouse because you know everybody became a coach and everybody became a mentor when when you know the world went on zoom and i said well first of all i look at sustainability yeah, and is that biased towards us? Absolutely, but we've been doing this for 25 years. Find somebody who's been doing the same thing, same content for 25 years and up leveling and staying current, they're pretty rough to find. If you go to uh, Tony Robbins, you know, the, what's his first one called the power of something? Um, mm -hmm. It's the same workshop. Again, very stock standard personal development. You don't need to change it. We didn't need to change ours. He's got a huge duration of personal development, but a lot of people, I'm not going to pick on them, but they've got different names for different things. And they're like, it's the theme of the year, theme of the year. And it's like, what sustainably can I hold on to that you teach? So I think sustainability is a huge part of how you spend to mentors. But then I really talked about sequencing. Like, why would you spend Facebook ads when you don't even have a damn website or converting web page or database? Like some people are so out of order. It's just shocking. And I mean, especially on our team, Thomas, Andrew, and Steve see it all the time. Like somebody's like in some digital marketing high-end course, I'm like, what the hell are you doing over there? You don't even have a database. You don't even have a tech team who can help you. You don't have the assets even set up, but you're in a podcast class because one day you might have one. I mean, it's odd. I mean, here's my favorite funny one. You have a bookkeeper and you're not making any money for them to count. Like, why are you spending money on a bookkeeper? So like, uh, a lot of like you're going to need a lot of stuff. Just write it down and then let us help you sequence it. Like, let's put it in order. Like, I, I just did a massive investment. Last year we did one in LinkedIn, and this year we're doing one on our YouTube channel. And well, but the investment's still there. We were already making it, but we changed and really up leveled our podcast team starting today. So, you know, it's in order, right? You kind of hire what you can afford at some level, and then you keep up leveling those assets and those, those investments. But it's not, I, I need it all today. So that's another spending issue, right? And some of you say, well, I wanna be at the big table. I can tell you, if you do not have assets, the table, it's gonna be frustrating for you because you're gonna to wanna to invest. You're gonna be like, oh my God, it's a gold mine out here. I wanna buy that, I wanna have that investment. So just stay in the 100K, just focus on your income for now. And then once that gets runway, and Thomas, maybe you tell your story, that's how you started. You started 100K and then you moved to the table. Mm -hmm. So we even, you know, radiate you because we don't want you frustrated. And there are people that are really frustrated at the big table because you know they wanted to jump fast and they didn't make enough money fast enough to buy the investments that are available. And the, and the table doesn't have investments, just to clarify. Clients, people that are clients. Right. <laughs> like right. Justin, you can go work out with, you work with Justin. I mean, there's, I don't know, probably dozens of people who do amazing real estate. You can go partner with them. That's not a table thing, it's a client thing. Now, Thomas, why don't you give your story a little bit and let's go back to a few questions. Yeah. So, you know, basically I had no clue what I was doing. I was like, what Laurel, you know, alluded to earlier, my sequencing was all out of order and then utilizing the workbook, specifically building, leading, protecting your business. And then later well cycle investing was able to consistently make the first year, uh, what I made in business monthly. And then from there, then you're able to start doing the appropriate projects and appropriate due diligence on the things that you want to get involved with. But what's great about what Laurel offers, we've seen it hundreds, if not thousands of times, if you follow the process and there's market validation of what you're offering, it's not a question of if you'll be successful, but when. The key is following the sequence. The key is doing the legwork and having that work. And I'm, you know, proof positive. I, I'm an example of that myself. So uh, there are a lot of folks out there that get your sequencing right. A lot of that's forecasting. A lot of that's doing the diligence, the, the, the review work of your business, working on your business, not in your business. And that will help you get to the level that you want to be. Yep. Katrina said, uh, how do I get involved? Um, any of you that want to get involved, um, just call our office right now. Just put your number in or uh, you can call our office. Our office number is 775-580-9200. Molly answers the phone. She will get you to a strategist after she asks a few questions. Um, uh, Lucy Ruth, absolutely. I have clients in Iceland. I have clients all over the world. Um, we have clients in Dubai, South Africa. 
uh, ton, thousands and thousands in Australia, New Zealand. So absolutely, I'd love to work if you in, if you're in Sweden. That would be phenomenal. And Michelle Drake, way up back up to the top. How many projects can you run under one corporation? That's a darn good question. Nobody has asked that one in a long darn time. So here's how. And I'm, you know, what's interesting is you all hear me is super aggressive and super intense. And then we start. <laughs> then you'll start seeing like the the slow your roll down conversation because. You know, having one company, it, first of all, it costs a little money to get it set up, which is fine. You want that investment. But for some of you who don't have a lot of what I call runway, where you're not making a lot of money. So, for example, um, if you wanted to do a little bit of coaching and you have a network marketing company that supports us, you do nutrition coaching um, or like I love the Mary Kay example. They're, they're image consultants um, that also sell Mary Kay clothing, jewelry, all that. I let them until they're making well into like a quarter million, put all that under one shop. Now, would you want to put a piece of real estate in there if you're going to invest in real estate? No. Like, but you could put like, I call it a hodgepodge, kind of a mishmash of a variety of business projects in one until one takes off. But to really separate them too soon, it's just a lot of cost that you may or may not need. Um, the one thing I'd say on the other side though, Michelle, don't ever shut your company down. So I am notorious for shelving my companies. And I was trained by a genius in this um, who taught me the value of a long-standing company. And like, it's interesting, my son's gonna be 22 this fall and Logan's finally, like he's getting it. Like, oh, all of these companies are gonna become ours, like the kids. I'm like, yeah, and you don't shut them down. I said, by the time I'm off the planet, some of these companies will be 50 years old. Do you know the value of a 50 year old corporation that has had at that point millions of dollars turned through it? A financial institute will look at that company as a very high, high, high value, valued asset. So a mistake I see a lot of people do is say Thomas and I did a real estate deal and we sold it. We high fived and said, do you want to go again? And Thomas like, no, I'm going to have more babies because he loves having babies right now. He has tons of little kids. I'm teasing you. <laughs> but, um, you, you would like one of us should take that company. And what you do is you you complete it. Whoever will say I want to keep it because I'm always you, I'm typically the one keeping him. I would indemnify Thomas and sign him out of the company. He'd resign. I'd sign him out. I'd indemnify him. I'd close the bank account and I'd let it sit. And I'd just keep the company clean and on a shelf. And then say a new idea comes up. Say Susie uh, wants to do a real estate deal with me. I'll pull it back off the shelf. Now Susie becomes my partner. Susie funds it. We open a bank account with Susie and Laurel, and then we go again. So I continue to get that history. So let's be honest. That's what Jason and I did. Jason and I picked up one that Kevin Harrington and I used to own together. So it's been shelved for a while. I indemnified Kevin and Brian Harrington, and I put Jason into the company. And voila, we have another company, but it's got a lot of history. It's got banking history. It's made it with Kevin. That that company made that one. We did the get um, the where's that book at? The put a shark in your tank. Right. So um, that one had hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars through it. Never made its way to a million, but it was a very viable corporation. So that was a long answer. But I think all that stuff's in the in the in the talk of financial freedom. I mean, those are little tiny strategies that are so significant that nobody teaches you this, like what I call the nitty gritty stuff. Uh, I think it's so critical that you do that. So in the beginning, yes, you can put a lot under one, Michelle, but over time, you're going to have to uh, babysit a little more. You're gonna to have to divide them up. And so, you know, crypto earnings. So what I would do with crypto earnings is I go get a Roth IRA and I grow your crypto, your digital currency through your Roth IRA. And again, just talk to our team. We have people in every one of these categories, people, people, people. Um, Aracelia, I don't know if I said that right. Uh, Araceli wanted the link and we gave that to her. It's integratedwealthsystems.com slash wealth 47. Again, to take advantage of that resource that Laura was talking about earlier. Laurel, yeah. I think that's an amazing point you had about when it comes to the crypto earnings, putting them in a Roth. Um, I know you've, you, we've sent out some emails talking about some, some events we may have coming up. Do you want to tease that at all right now a little bit? I will. We have been, I mean, our community has been begging for cryptocurrency and we've, we've made a few runs at it. Um, I believe all those are taken down and they should be because they're outdated and mm -hmm. well, you don't, it doesn't take long to outdate yourself in cryptocurrency. Actually, I don't mind because it's David, I mean, it's pretty generic stuff, but you can see how fast. What would be interesting, actually, we should keep it up and give it as a bonus, because you'll see, was that 17 or 18? When I think it was 17, it, yeah. And how different it is. I mean, everything that you'll hear in that, we could just give it away as a bonus. I mean, but that was like state of the art at that time when we interviewed those guys. That was 
like yeah. the best stuff to do. Like, oh my God, people's little heads were on fire. Going, oh my God. Now that's like the norm. And now we've ele elevated and Kelly Korsak, the designer of all of smart portfolios at iFlip is going to be teaching a four week class on digital currency. He spent two years untangling the algorithms. What's right? What's wrong? How do you do it? And a Roth IRA, uh, you can fund, if you're over 50, you can fund at 7,000 a year. If you're under 50, 6,000 a year. So it's not a lot, but it becomes a lot, right? I mean, a lot of those digital currencies, um, you know, I bought it four, 9,000 Bitcoins way up, all that growth, right? Mm -hmm. Now I can continue to keep trading on those profits. So uh, the Roth is the best place to put that kind of stuff. So that isn't what you put in your corporation. That is not what you put in your corporation. So one defining thing with Michelle and your corporation question is businesses, active income and investment income. They should never marry. They should never touch. That is the one big rule. But a variety of business ideas and nothing's really totally taken off. You know, like you could put a book, a podcast, some funnel, a direct sales company. You put all sorts of stuff in one until one thing takes off, then you divide it out. But again, that's why we have expert teams. Our team and Scott will tell you exactly when to do that and when to separate. So let's go one more question here. Um, There's one there from Tim. He wants to ask a little bit more about just the discrepancy or definitions, differences of entities, LLCs, <laughs> uh, C-Corps, yes, things like that. It does matter. There's a taxation that's different. A C-Corp is a completely different entity, has its own tax structure that doesn't flow through or even no. touch your personal. An S-Corp and LLC limited partnership all flows through the profits to you eventually. Right. Uh, again, big distinctions is you file taxes separately, not as one big bundle. You ever get in litigation and they ask for uh, your tax returns inside the one company, it better not be bundled with the rest or you've just like unloaded your entire asset list to somebody else. Really bad idea. And a lot of lazy CPAs make that uh, decision uh, or if you're not, you know, designing it. Oh, for shelving? No, it does not matter. No, I put everything up. Um, any, any of them, uh, you would preserve all of it. Yep, at all times. And that's a worldwide principle. I know a lot of Canadians, um, they tend to close and open and close and open. And there's some companies, and the only reason they're telling you to close and open and close and open is because they're going to charge you for more entities, right? Let's just be honest. You do not have to do it. The only reason I wouldn't shelf it is if there was a lot of trailing liability to it. Like if there was the business you in had some trailing liability where something could come back, I would not shelf it. Um, that's like the only, the mm. only reason. Otherwise, and like it's, let's just say there was a license involved. Well, that person should take the license out and take it back and take it somewhere else with them. Um, so you can dissect it down to just the shell, and then you're going to shell it and shelf it. <laughs> that's funny. I finished. <laughs> it's just going to be a shell. You're going to put it on the shelf. <laughs> and I would shelf it for a minimum of three to six months before I'd reuse it. I wouldn't reuse an active in entity with another partner right away. You got to kind of let it cool off and just let it sit and do nothing for a little minute. One question of you saw it there, Laurel. Um, St. George asked, are you saying to set up separate corporations for investments? Yes, absolutely. I mean, you're going to develop your own money rules, but you wouldn't put... Um, like a Roth is, a, is an individual account and the rest of you around the world in Sweden or Canada, they're typically more like the, 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 the uh, title is a tax-free savings account, TFSA. So you could do that. Um, but as far as the companies, I'm sorry, what's the question with all the entities? Separating your corporations from investments. Oh yeah, so like if you have real estate, like real estate and gas and oil can sometimes get combined but you wouldn't put like, you know, real estate with like I own the black hole. I wouldn't put my real estate with the black hole, right? right? And what I own in the black hole or the Ford dealership. Like, yes, you want to keep your assets and partnerships and liabilities separate from your assets. Absolutely. And our team is brilliant at untangling that for you. If you have it all tangled up. Yep. Absolutely. Let's do one more question. The final question here, we'll go ahead and put it in the uh, webinar chat if you've not yet done so. Uh, also, you've on social media, you can go ahead and ask your question. We'll have it live answered here. And then Laurel, as we're waiting for that question to come in, when it comes to declaring your financial independence, 
what's the one piece of advice you have, generally speaking, for people looking to make that change? Get busy making money. And for those of you who have money sitting around, get it invested. And I'm going to tell you a story, and I'm going to send this video specifically to some families because they're letting their family dictate their wealth. And their family's illiterate. They do not know financial literacy at all. And they're letting their kids or their family members vote of whether they invest or not. So I'm going to give you an example. So I have a client. Um, I will, I'm not going to change the numbers, about $300,000 sitting in cash and needs about 1500 more in cash flow to, for living expenses. So just do simple math, folks. You take 300,000, right? Let's just do it together, right? Get out your little calculator here, <clears throat> right? So you take $300,000 and you can easily, like in your sleep, you could find 10%. So at 10%, that's $30,000. So 30,000 divided by 12 is $2,500. Right, this client only needs fifteen hundred to live, so it gives her an extra thousand dollars in cash flow a month to go grow her company. And then there's no more bleeding. The three hundred stays parked. It's absolutely like stays in this pristine asset position. She can live on fifteen hundred of the cash flow until the business can use a thousand to grow the company. And then once the company's up, stop living on the cash flow and reinvest the twenty five hundred a month. If you're not, if your investments aren't making that kind of money, you need to like really look at your lazy assets. So um, if you want financial independence, it's make it, invest it, make it, invest it. That's the pattern that you need to create in your life. And that's how our coaching and mentoring, we don't tell you what to do. We're not advisors. We are really smart, experienced people who are going to help guide you and educate you and help you come up with money rules to do that. So um, it starts with this, though. You got to pick a path, make a plan. That's my new thing. You've heard of my videos earlier, Taz, right? Pick a path, which path do you want? You can take a very slow path to this wealth building or you can take a fast path. But this is a complete plan that was designed for that. And then if you want the coaching to go with the plan, at least start at the 47 bucks. This week, um, I do wanna make a final plug. We are doing our marketplace. Um, and my new, I, my new talk track, I think you've heard me say, Thomas, is I don't want you for two days. All I need you is for 13 hours. Two days sounds like too long, so people freak out. I need you for 13 hours and we'll change your life with money. So from 10 to 6 on Thursday and 10 to 3 on Friday, that's it. If that's all you attend, I'll have you long enough to have changed your life and you're thinking about money. So give me 13 hours, please. <laughs> all right. So, uh, so much information. Kent Davis, okay. come on. You got to keep up. You're so good. Come on. And I hope, it, and I, I hope that you like this information. Was that like a thumbs up? Give me some like, you know, was this a good one? Did you like this one? 13 hours. That's all I want. People like right. that. And again, if you've not yet had a chance to sign up or attend the Millionaire Maker Meetup of Marketplace, go call 775-588-9200. Molly and the team will be able to register for you for that event if you've not done so. And if you uh, have not done it, go ahead. Go to integratedwealthsystems.com slash wealth47. Get the resource. It is a valuable piece of your wealth building plan. Need you to fill it out. Building your wealth cycles. And if you are not hitting your goals, at the halfway point of 2021, help do that resource, use that document to get back on track. And in with my blue light therapy here. I think it's kind of fun. I mean, I, I like that. We just need, we need, we need a meditation. Sparklers. To go with <laughs> like you said, I need sparklers out of my head. So we had super, we had so much fun this weekend. <laughs> it was, uh, it, we always have fun on the fourth. I think it's so fun. Well, it's a halfway mark. So it's defining now, uh, now it's a stretch to the finish line to make 2021 your best year. And uh, you got to get, you got to take it seriously and you got to get to it. So thanks to all of you. Those of you on our podcast, if you have any questions or have requests, go to askworld.com. Uh, you can put in your name, phone number, email, ask a question, make a request. Those of you on social media, same thing. Always askworld.com is where you have access to always ask questions of our, of me or our team. So uh, thanks. And uh, we'll be back next Tuesday, 12 noon. If you enjoy it, please share this. Also, you are free to share this free. Where's the replay link for this? Uh, does, it goes to millionaires in training, right? This will automatically be posted to the Facebook groups. Uh, we'll also be turned into a podcast episode. So depending where you're at, you'll have the opportunity to see this. And like Laurel said, we have another uh, number of social media investments coming in the near future. We're going to see more of this content on a regular basis across many platforms. We're looking forward to bringing it to you. Yeah. So have a great day. Take care. Talk to you next Tuesday. 
those of you that are clubhousers, uh, at one o'clock, we go live on the Millionaire Maker Club every Tuesday at one o'clock. So uh, those of you that are clubhouse people, we'll meet you over there. Take care. And if you don't know about Clubhouse, ask Molly when you call in. Thanks, guys. Uh, leave it open for just a minute for people to grab any uh, links in the chat there, Steve. And uh, we'll leave it open for a few seconds. So just those of you who are on Zoom, you can scroll up and down and grab the different links and the phone numbers to uh, get a hold of our team, including Jason. If you don't have insurance, get out there and give him a call. All right. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Real Money Talks podcast. Your host has been Laurel Langmire, author of five New York Times bestsellers, money expert on Dr. Phil, CNN, CNBC, The Street TV, Fox News, and The View. Want to learn more about off Wall Street investing, tax strategies, and multi-million dollar business strategies? Visit liveoutloud.com slash podcast for past episodes, show notes, and resources. For some special wealth building gifts only for Laurel's podcast listeners, visit liveoutloud.com slash podcast gifts. Do you have a burning question for Laurel? Visit asklaurel.com to submit your question, and it may just be covered on a podcast episode. So stay tuned and be sure to subscribe to get new episodes every week.